Welcome to Femcasters, a podcast and community where feminine wiles and ferocious female voices collide. Femcasters was born from the idea that we can change the world one broadcast at a time. We are here to unite and elevate the voices of silence breakers just like you, girl wide. Let's kick it, Karina. Kick it. Today, we're going to meet an incredible woman, the perfect femcaster. She leverages her position as a thought leader, news icon, and influencer for good. Her name is Nana Abba Anamoa, and she is one of the most prominent journalists in Ghana. She is the radio and TV personality of the year, an award that she's won for the second time in three years. Other awards include TV News Reporter of the Year, Current Affairs Presenter of the Year, and Ghanaian Woman of the Year. She's a social media personality. She has over 4 million followers on Instagram, and that might be even much greater than the last time I got the chance to connect with her. (laughs) She's a queen of social media in Ghana with a staggering following and is currently serving as the general manager of GH1 TV and Star 103.5 FM. Nana Abba, welcome. Thank you very much, Corina and Julie. Now, I know that you've spent, obviously, a great deal of time working in media and that you're also now working to develop your own charity. So I was hoping that you could share with our community just a little bit about what your experience has been as a woman in broadcasting in Ghana and the sorts of things that have helped you to be successful. Well, it's been a roller coaster for me as a woman in Ghana because uh, the terrain is very different. The media in Ghana is dominated more, you know, with men. If you go to most newsrooms, you find more men than women. If you're listening to the radio in the morning and in the morning, the belt is, is a morning show. It's very hardcore politics, current affairs. You have more men doing it. Uh, if you find a woman, she'll probably be handling lifestyle or entertainment. And that has been a challenge for me for the longest period. It took me a while to break that with my former employer, uh, TV3, because they thought that, well, as a woman, you wake up in the morning, you may have cramps because you are menstruating, or you have responsibilities to your children or your husband, and so it is not a Holla. Yes, you're <laughs> speaking to me, girl. <laughs> the same reason we don't have a female president yet here right. in yeah. the United States. So it's, it's, it was very challenging, but I was able to break that. I, I got onto the scene. I was handling political interviews. I was doing a lot of hot stories, breaking news. And then there were people who were very excited that finally there is a woman, there is a, a fresh of, uh, you know, breath air. But it came with a lot of challenges as well, because number one, you're dealing with men who are largely misogynist they you you are judged the mistakes that men will do and go scot-free a woman will not be pardoned a woman will not be forgiven so for instance i remember a couple of years ago i interviewed the then president of the country and i asked him very tough questions and then one of the questions that i asked him towards the end of the, the interview Because at the time, unemployment rate was really high. Armed robbery was high. Crime was high at the time. It was a very challenging period for Ghana. So I asked him if he's able to sleep at night, despite all of these challenges. And there was such a backlash in the country because people didn't understand the question. They thought that I was asking if he's able to have sex at night with his wife. (laughs) That is how it was interpreted by a lot of people. They didn't get it. So... All the work that I had done, all the questions that I had asked him about the economy, about security, all of that was just brushed aside. And then they focused on that one question. And it was such a huge backlash in the country. So as a woman, I've had to deal with a lot. There's a lot of stereotyping, a lot of lies, because I'm a very tough person. Uh, People are Uh, they find it very difficult to control me. Even my employers struggle to control me because I won't allow you to interfere with my work. And so you find men fabricating stories about you. Uh, The number of times I've been called a prostitute, the number of times I've been called a a lesbian, they've labeled me as a lesbian because they know that in Ghana, people look, look down on lesbians. There is this whole stupid 
agenda against the LGBT community. So they, they try to say things that would get people to attack me every now and then. It's been very tough, but I have a very thick skin. I have survived. Every time they throw it at me, I throw it back at them. Like the, the case of the prostitute. When they say I'm a prostitute, I say, well, it, it's my body. I decide which man I want to sleep with. It's not, <laughs> it's not of your business. If they call me a lesbian, I said, it's my body. I decide what I want to do. It is, it's, it's, it's my decision if I want to uh, be with a man or be with a woman. It's my decision to make. So it's it's been... A journey now they know that they you really can't go after Nanaba because I'm a very tough person and I will probably dish it out to you more than you came at me uh, with and so mm -hmm. that that's how the journey has been but it has also shaped me to make me a better person it's made me stronger it's put me in position in a position where I can guide a lot of young women so that even when they meet challenges like mine they know exactly how to cope with it Wow so one of the things that I love about you is your willingness to stand up for <laughs> what you believe in and also stand against those things that strike a chord in you. And so when I got a chance to connect with you before, you shared the story of how you have had the opportunity to stand up for the LGBTQIA yeah. community. Yeah. And I think it's just something that has helped citizens of the world to connect with your message in a way that I think is really important. And so I wonder if you have any other kind of items like that that are striking a chord with you where you're you know, working to get them out into the media a little bit more because you think that they deserve more attention. Absolutely. So, so the LGBTQ community, for instance, I mean, we, in, in Ghana, I don't know if it is hypocrisy. We don't really understand the LGBTQ community or we pretend to understand, but we don't. There's a lot of learning and unlearning uh, to be done. And I don't blame them because some time ago I was in a similar uh, situation, in a similar position because I didn't understand the issues in the, in, the, in the community. I had to be hit with a reality and then I had to learn read more and then understood the community, then I was able to, you know, stand up for them. Another group of people that I, we all don't pay attention to in Ghana, the members of the physically challenged community. So in Ghana, if you're physically challenged, it means that you are, you, you will not be employed. Hmm. Uh, if you're blind, you are not going to be employed. If you can't hear, you can't be employed. If you're sitting in a wheelchair, it's difficult for you to get a job. Over the years, I have, I have tried so hard to use my influence to get government to pay more attention to them. So for instance, in every recruitment that I have done, I bring in people from the physically challenged community, just so people know that disability is not inability. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're disabled doesn't mean your brain doesn't work. They are able to work. I, I know a, a few, a few media houses tried bringing in uh, physically challenged people and what they did which i found nauseating at the time was for them to focus on stories that concerned the community and i said that i said to a few of my colleagues in other media houses that you can't do that you can't bring a blind person to your institution and ask them to cover issues of the of the physically challenged because you think it's he's one of them or she's one of them that, that's not how it works we need to integrate them properly. They have to be doing other stories. The stories that you feel that able people sh should do, they can also do those stories. Another group of people is the mentally challenged. I've done so many stories in that area. In fact, at the time we were passing the bill, there was a lot of delay in parliament. I led a lot of advocacy, a lot of campaigns, just so the bill could be passed. And when it passed, we've got a mental health authority even though things are not as great as I expected, it is way better than 10 years ago when we didn't have an authority to fight for the rights of these people. And Anna, I mean, like, you are at the forefront of the modern modernization of voices for the marginalized, if you will, I feel, from what you just shared in Ghana. How does this even begin? Where was that seed planted? as a young girl, because I know, I know, I see it <laughs> and I see you smile. Like, I know that it was planted somewhere to, someone cultivated your voice or you were inspired to have this voice that you just break down barrier after barrier. Yeah, I credit to my father. My father is a fighter. My father always said to me that, I mean, in, in my family, I'm the only one who's like my dad. 
uh, because my dad likes to talk. My dad is very animated. My, my other siblings are very shy. They like to keep stay in their shell. So I'm more vocal, just like my father. And my father always said to me that you don't need money uh, to make a change in your community. You must use your voice all the time. When you see ill, you must talk about it. You, you shouldn't just think about yourself. You should think about other people because it's like a community. If you spend so much money building tall walls to protect yourself, somebody will climb over into that building and kill you one night. So what you have to do is to try and make life better for everybody in the community if you can, so that you can live peacefully. When you go to bed at night, you know that you are at peace with yourself. So you don't spend too much money on your security. And so that's the kind of training my father gave me. And every single time I feel that I need to make life better for other people, not with money, but with the influence that I have, the little influence that I have, I just feel that I, I need to make life better for people so that when you are at point A, in another year's time, you shouldn't still be at point A, you should move to point B. And it's, it's a process for everybody. And I like to see people win with me. I, I don't like to be the only person who is winning in, in, my, in my community. I want everybody to be at par with me. So that's the kind of training I got when I was young. Well, that comes through in your actions. If you follow <laughs> Nana Abba on Instagram. And those are some pretty actions with, we have to mention her beautiful nails. I mean, yes. those are like beyond, beyond. <laughs> so if you do follow Nana Abba's social media, in particular Instagram, you'll see her raising the voices of other people, in particular the women that you are leading and broadcasting presently that you have taken under your arm to help make the shining stars that they are today. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that mentorship and leadership, because it's coming through that it's like your dad sitting on your shoulder mm -hmm. and telling yeah. you the same thing that you're then enabling these other people to kind of champion as their own, which I yeah. just love. Yeah, I, I took up uh, the, the, the responsibility of mentoring people because I'm a product of mentorship. Apart from the kind of mentorship my father gave me, when I, when I started out as a presenter, I had a lot of people helping me a majority of them were men so a lot of men held my hand they thought well because i was very young i started when i was about 18 or 19 so i was very young and so there were people in the newsrooms who thought they had to protect me i don't know from who but <laughs> they protected me a lot they gave me opportunities they guided me and because i benefited so much and it made life very easy for me in the newsroom and i had seen people who did not benefit from mentorship as well. And even though they were in the newsroom before I joined, because I was getting guidance and because I was listening and I had a, a teachable spirit, I was able to make inroads. I was able to, for instance, get on TV very early. I was doing big stories because I was constantly learning. I was willing to learn. And so when I got into a position of you know, leadership, I felt that I had to give back as well. And I had seen so many young people, especially women, who wanted to be on TV. Uh, they wanted to be in the media, but they were not getting the opportunities. Either there were men in the media houses who wanted to sleep with them before they gave them the role, or they felt that these, pe these girls had to work extra by not just in the newsroom or in the media house, but you had to send them, go and buy me food. They, they were almost like behaving like mates to some of these people in the media houses. And I found it very repugnant that you can't treat people this way. It's like modern day slavery. You can't do that because someone is looking for an opportunity. And so I decided that I have to give back. I have to mentor people so they don't make the kind of mistakes that I made early in my career. And so th that's why I, I do this. And I'm happy that I'm doing it. Sometimes it's tiring because almost everybody wants uh, Nanaba to mentor them and I can only do so much and it breaks my heart when I have to say no to people uh, because the look on their faces is so sad <laughs> it breaks my heart but I, I also have to protect myself I need to focus on myself and so I can only take in just as many as I, I can at a time. Well, that's just amazing. And I will just say that it's been such a pleasure to watch that journey and a continual way. And I know, Julie, you have quite a few questions for Nana Abba as well. Well, she so. blows my mind. She said 4 million followers. I don't even know how to 
you know, like I go back and forth with social media. So I have a love hate relationship. You know, I hate it, but I know it's a necessary evil. But 4 million followers, that does give you influence, it does give you authority. And, you know, being a good steward of this following that you have, I mean, that's, that's like, this is mind blowing actually for me. Besides understanding how you use your influence, you know, and I'm from just, I'm from Chicago. So, you know, and I mentioned, I've never been to Ghana and I'd love to know like the differences, if you know the differences between the American media, the way Americans present themselves, their voices and the voices in Africa as well. Well, in Africa, I mean, in, 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 in the U.S., you have a lot of freedom. There is a lot of freedom, even though uh, in 2019, I think in 2019 or 2018, for the first time, Ghana went ahead of the U.S. for the ranking for press freedom. I think, yeah, and it, it shocked everybody. And I could understand at the time, President Trump, Trump, Donald Trump was your president. Uh, so there were a lot of interferences. The good uh, old but... days, the good old days, <laughs> Nana Eva. But in, in the USA, you have a lot of freedom. I mean, I watch some of your channels. I watch ABC. I watch Fox News. I watch CNN. I watch MSNBC. I want to tell them a lot. And there is a lot of freedom. I mean, people go on air and they say whatever they they want to say. But yeah, in packaged Ghana, as news. It's not always news. <laughs> it's not always news, no. But in Ghana, you don't have that kind of freedom. I've had colleagues who've been killed in other African countries because of the stories they did. I've had colleagues in Ghana who've been beaten to pulp because they dared criticize a government. I've had colleagues who've been threatened, female colleagues who've been threatened that if you stay on this course, we are going to rape you, we'll find you and rape And so- Wow. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's huge. Well, you're not yeah. mentioning the times that you've actually also been threatened. Yeah. And then I have been attacked. Uh, unfortunately, I don't get some of these threats, but on social media, I get attacked on a daily basis because of my views because I shared a certain opinion about a policy. So you get people attacking you. It's it's I, and I call them attack dogs. The last time I used that 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 line, the government in power got so upset. Um so th and they were reacting everywhere that I had called the people attack dogs. But that's that's what it is. You get attacked in in Ghana in most of Africa. And so sometimes you're torn between do I have to be a journalist? make my point, do the story the best way I know, or should I be guided in a certain way? Because if you're not careful, you may not wake up the next day. The way you, people walk into your room and find a dead body, or you just disappear. And it happens a lot in Africa. Fortunately, in Ghana, we don't have a lot of these reports. But once in a while, some of these come in, and it's very heartbreaking. A couple of years ago, one of our colleagues was shot and killed on his way to work because he had put together an investigative piece and there were people who were unhappy with the work he had done. He was threatened. He thought that he was a very vocal journalist. He had done his work. He was happy with the work he had done. People had been arrested. Uh, people were being prosecuted. On his way to work, someone, just, on a, someone on a motorbike just shot and killed him. The guy is dead. Till date, no arrests have been made. Nothing has been done about it. And every year journalists talk about it and nothing happens. And people who sat on, on radio and TV and threatened this guy are still walking about freely and nothing has been done about them. So it makes you wonder, do I have to be the kind of journalist that I have to be? Should I go out and tell the story as it is or should I massage the story? So it's very dangerous for a lot of African journalists. I mean, gradually things are changing. People are becoming more aware. I hope one day we'll have an audience like the, the US audience where people accept views. Uh, they don't go attacking. I mean, the fact that I have a different view from yours doesn't mean you're an, you an enemy. It doesn't mean I have to find you and kill you or beat you up. So I'm hoping that one day we'll get there. But it's better than what we have in Ghana is better than a lot of African countries. But it's still not very good enough. I wish that journalists would be free to go on air and say whatever they like to say. I mean, I, I'm almost speechless because I become very 
rested in the laurels of liberty, whatever it looks like, no matter who the president is at the time. Mm -hmm. But the you're a warrior in the sense in enabling free speech and giving those viewpoints. And when viewpoints and voices are muted, that's where bigotry starts. That's where yeah. racism starts. That's where all the stuff that, I mean, it goes on in the United States, but it seems so amplified in Ghana and mm -hmm. that you are standing there as a beacon of light, of hope for people to give them that hope. But I mean, I am just in awe, to be honest, your story is so empowering and that you're doing this as a woman in mm -hmm. Africa. I mean, <laughs> how many other women in Africa are as bold as you are? I know that you must have a circle around you, but oh, yes, it's absolutely. Huge. We have a few women like that. I wish we would have more women, but a lot of them are afraid as well. Because number one, another thing about being a very vocal journalist in, in, in this part of the world, it would affect your relationships. You would be, I mean, men wouldn't want to be associated with you because they feel you're being attacked all the time. Your name is always on the lips of other people. And so they stay away from you. So you realize that a, 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 a few of us who are very vocal, even at 40, 41, 42, are not married. And it's not the main reason, but it is part of it. It is, it is part of the reason a lot of them are, a lot of us are single. I mean, the number of times that it's been used against me, I make my views known on an issue. And the first thing that is thrown at me, oh, go and find a husband. And I say, well, I mean, I don't need a husband to make me a complete woman. <laughs> I am complete as I, as, as I am. I'm very happy with myself. But yes, you find a few women who are very vocal. They stand their ground. They stand for something. And I'm very proud of them. And it makes me like, is there a fear factor? Like, do you, are you fearful because you are using your voice? I mean, because you are so bold and going against the grain. No, I have no fears at oh, all. Good. Not, a sing not a single one. I, I am You've... fearless. And I oh, think that is. <laughs> I love that. I love you even more. I didn't know I could. I think but that's I love my, you even more. That's, that's one of the things that keep me going. And my mom always says that I am fearless and she thinks that is my weakness as well. You're, you scare I'm, your mom. Let's be honest. You scare yes, your mom a little bit. <laughs> she, gets, she gets really worried. My mom gets really, really worried sometimes. And I think if she had her own way, I would just wake up one day and say, I'm not going to do the media again. I'm not going to talk about any issues again. But I mean, there's nothing I can do about it. This is just me. This is who I am. And that's it. But I am fearless. I, I, and I've said it so many times to people on social media that I am not afraid of anybody in this country. I'm not afraid of anyone in Ghana. I say what I have to say because I believe in it. I believe it is the truth. And I will say it any day, any time. And I stand by it and I don't render any apologies at all. Yeah. Wow. Well, you actually... Unapologetic. Unapologetic. <laughs> Unapologetically, <laughs> yeah. Nana Abba yeah. Anamoa. <laughs> now, one of the things that I love about this whole story is that you are also creating an army of new young people who are willing to also take a stand Absolutely. as you mentor the next generation of broadcasters that work with you. And I just Absolutely. think that's so incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I know too that through fostering the active community that you've built, you also have people who come to your defense in social spaces. And one oh, yes. of the things that we talked about in an earlier episode with Chris Kremitzos, who is talking to a lot of podcasters, he said, you know, there's a, this rampant surge in people getting bullied online and cyberbullying in the podcasting community too, especially video podcasts where they criticize how the girl looks and, 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 and. So I was thinking it would be helpful for our community here from you, how you have developed that thick skin to just let it roll right off your back. Um, well, I, I don't think I even had a formula uh, for it. I just don't like it when people try to mute my voice. I mean, I, I don't like it when people make me feel that I am stupid. And so I won't allow anyone to, to cower me, to push me into any shell. I know myself better than anyone. And mm -hmm. so what you say about me is a lie. I don't have time to prove to anyone that what you're saying about me is a lie. If you believe it, that is your problem. You're stupid enough to believe anything that you 
read online about me. Um, so I, I don't even waste my time trying to defend myself or trying to clarify anything. This is what I signed up to do. I knew the repercussions. I knew the consequences it would come with. And I accepted those consequences. I mean, I get bullied all the time on social media every I mean, every single day, even this morning, I, I saw a few uh, posts. I just ignore them. If I don't ignore them, I, 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 I will block you. If I don't block you and you find me in a very bad mood, I may respond. And <laughs> my response may just get you to deactivate your account. I've done that a few times and I have people coming back to my office to apologize to me that I never meant to say that to you. I was just in a bad place. That is why I said that. So I think that people are just sometimes mentally unstable mm -hmm. and that is why they come to social media to project their anger on others. And I've learned that the hard way. I just think that no matter where you are, if this is what you want to do, you need to understand that there are people who will come at you, not because you're doing something wrong, just because they feel that the position you're occupying is for them. They have to be there and they can't be there. There are others who are also looking for an avenue to express themselves, project their unhappiness, and that is what makes them happy. So you must develop a thick skin. If you can't develop the thick skin, just look at these things, ignore them, move on and do what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, majority of the people are going to like the work you're doing. They're just a few idiots who are going to be obsessed with what you're doing. A and really, idiots. it's always a few. <laughs> it's always a few, really. A stupid it's idiots. A few. Yeah. Yeah. But it so, speaks to you, Nana Abba, for really having a strong sense of self and having <laughs> good parentage and being taught at an early age not to be afraid to use your voice, you know, use your voice not to harm others, but use your voice to raise others. And that's what I see it speaking to. And you yeah. know yourself. That's why you are unfaltering. That's why you <laughs> rise every time there's yeah. that hater. And I always say if you have a hater, it means you've made it, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but you know, too many haters are just a pain in the <laughs> a pain in the butt. But I mean, it is a sense of your strength and who you are as a human being. You know the difference between right and wrong, and you're not afraid to to say it. So, I mean, sit, oops, sitting at your feet. Honestly, I'm amazed. But I mean, I want everybody the name Nana Abba to be. <laughs> a name in the United States that just rolls off of our tongues. Seriously. Seriously. <laughs> Prolific. Prolific and fearless, for sure. Wow. Well, I mean, what would we sum up today with? I'd love to know. Prolific and fearless. <laughs> I mean, I, I just think the things we've talked about really resonate with me. They're focused on the power of mentorship and guiding people with faith uh, to do what you feel is right and really create that kind of sense of community that comes with that, of being fearless and of caring for what your mission is and what your voice is and just being true to that regardless of what the naysayers may say. And I think all of those lessons are things that we can all learn from. So Absolutely. I'm just so appreciative of this message, of the time, of all the work that you're doing. Thank you. I just love it. <laughs> It's, it's my honor to have known you. I'm going to go follow you and I'm going to become obsessed with you. So <laughs> thank I hope, you. Do you answer if I message you on Instagram? Please, you I will be waiting. <laughs> okay. Thank you very cool. so much. And what do we say, Karina, at the end of our episodes? Kick it. Kick gonna, it. It's a little silly, but as we lead into our intro music or exit music, it's not like silly. To ask, it's very serious. Okay. Very it's very serious. serious. <laughs> we like to ask all of our guests say two words and that's just kick it. Kick it. Yeah. That was perfect. It. it makes me so excited. <laughs> You've been like, practicing. <laughs> You've been practicing. Oh, yes. But then I just, I hear it in the background kind of ramping in, like just in my imagination, which is really nice. Let's kick it, Jules. Let's kick it with Nana Abba. Woo! <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Femcasters. We hope you were inspired. We hope you were motivated. We hope you think a little bit differently about how your voice, your very own voice can change the universe. So tap on those five stars, share the love, share this episode with another Femcaster that you think 
could use this message today. And head over to femcasters.com for all the goods we covered today, including tools to elevate your voice. You can join our exclusive community and celebrate the Femcaster in you. Together, we can elevate the power and the voice of women girl-wide. Let's do this.